Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's Future in Space Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell. I work at deepastronomy.space. And today we are going to be talking about, as we do with these hangouts with Future in Space, we're going to be talking about the future of space telescopes, in particular a mission that NASA is currently planning as we speak uh, for a successor to some of NASA's current space telescopes. We've got the James Webb Space Telescope being launched late next year. Following that will be the Widefield Infrared Survey Telescope, or W first. But what's going to come after that? That's what we're going to talk about today. And NASA is considering several proposals, who I am also told are not in competition with each other, but they are, let's say, friendly. They are uh, aggressively being considered <laughs> for their uh, for their uh, next role for their spot in NASA's premier observatory lineup. So um, I want I. I, I want to let you guys know as we do every week that uh, i am looking at several social media channels i'm looking at youtube uh the live chat and i'm seeing several people already there i see john suffle for example uh is there hi john and uh also i'm looking at facebook as well as periscope and twitch as well so all of these um uh, all of these are open and i'm looking at them so i hope you'll leave your questions and comments for us now i have been experimenting with some new video chat software folks and i know that you guys noticed yesterday in a hangout that the audio levels were a little bit wonky i'm still working on it but i trust you'll let me know if they're not okay now i think i've uh, got them as about as normalized as i can get them i need to make sure i speak clear into the microphone so you can hear me better and not back away like i often do and uh, so let me know if that will work okay so let um I also want to remind you, Harley will be joining us shortly, uh, but he had to he had to take a phone call. But usually, it's his job to talk about the sponsorship of these hangouts. They are they are sponsored and uh, uh, endorsed by the American Astronomical Society and the American Astronautical Society. And these two groups want uh, they use these hangouts as a way for their membership to get the word out. Uh, up to the general public about some of the work that's being gone that's being done by many of the members and with the case of the american astronautical society this one is a good uh, candidate for that because we also like to talk about the engineering and the technical aspects of some of the uh, efforts going into space not just the astronomy not just the science although we talk about both so i want to thank both the uh, both aas's for sponsoring our hangouts so let me go ahead and pull up my guests uh, with me is um let me do it this way so as you can see my new video chat software is here <laughs> i've been playing around in the upper uh in the upper left <laughs> i'm trying not to i'm laughing because it's sort of like this uh scientific brady bunch i'm going to show you guys this look what i can do i've done this as kind of a joke watch this if i make myself visible and i do this then i'm in the middle and i can look and see all of the <laughs> I'm sorry. I just find that hilarious. I can look down. There's Harley down there, and there's Deborah. Okay, enough. Of that. Uh, okay, I, I'm done playing. Uh, let me get let me get this let me get this back uh, to normal. Okay, in the upper left is my is uh, Dr. John O'Meara. He's a professor of physics at St. Michael's College. Uh, he's also the Cosmic Origins. Uh, he's also a member of the Cosmic Origins. No, he's not the member. He's the lead of the Cosmic Origins Science Working Group on Louvre. In the lower right is uh, Dr. Deborah Fisher. She is a professor of astronomy at Yale University, and she is also the community co-chair of Louvoir. Also in the upper right is Carl Clark. He'll be helping us uh, with getting the uh, uh, visual scene. And, of course, Harley Thronson's back. Hi, Harley. Hey, good afternoon, folks. Good afternoon. Okay, good. Why don't you get us started <laughs> with, uh, with Louvoir a little bit. Talk a little bit about NASA's overall Goals. Okay. Um, yeah, we've got a real treat for the next uh, next couple of months. Um, a couple of years ago, NASA, in preparation for one of the most important evaluation, prioritization, assessment activities, the National Academy's um, Decadal Survey, which I'll mention, I'll describe in a, in a little bit in just a moment. Um, NASA has begun to fund assessment study activities, evaluations of science goals, identification of key technology areas, and so on, for four major mission concepts. We're going to be hearing of, about one today. We'll be hearing about the next three over the next couple of months. Um, and uh, this, the, the goal will be to prepare a description of these missions, emphasis on the science, that the National Academies uh, will be evaluating in a beginning in about two years and will in turn recommend to NASA for implementation in the next and the subsequent 10 to 15 years. 
So we've got two of the leaders of one of those assessment activities with us today. Now, why is it that you guys are, are reluctant to call this a competition? What is it just a, is it a friendly, are you, is it just an aggressive, well, let me just ask you, is it, is it something that, it's important to everybody, I gather, and so it's important that your science be chosen, but it's not really a competition, is it? And no, either, I, one, I, either one of you can comment. I, the, the reason why I don't like to phrase it as a competition is because, um, you know, if I, if I look at the, the way that we've done things in the past, we had a suite of great observatories like Hubble, Chandra, and, and Spitzer. And those, those were three great observatories, oftentimes working together. And, um, and the decadal survey could come back and say, we want two of these missions. We could want one of these missions. We could want zero of these missions. We could want all four. Um, and I think really the, the key thing here is for us to highlight the science and technology that we want to we want to do with Louvoir and for each of those missions to do the same. And um, when we put our best foot forward, who knows, the decadal might choose more than one. Right. And right. Uh, I need to I need to uh, correct something I said early on. I didn't actually tell you what Louvoir stood for. It stands for Large Ultraviolet Optical Infrared Telescope, I guess, Louvoir. Now, if you're French, that's Louvoir. And if you're from the South, that's Louvoir. So, so, uh, yeah, that's, it's going to be a wide ranging telescope, isn't it, John? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I think the way that I like to think about it is that it's, it's really the, the, the giant version of, of Hubble in terms of its, its Swiss army knife ability to go from all, from the ultraviolet all the way up through the infrared to do very deep imaging, to do spectroscopy, to do coronography, uh, to go out and find exoplanets and characterize their atmospheres. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's very, very large. I think we've got a, a video here of, um, ah, yes, yeah, so let's take a look at that, comparison. Carl, if you can cue that up while he's talking. Yeah. There's a fun comparison between the, the size of, uh, things that we know and love like Hubble and how big we were thinking, we're thinking for Louvoir. So on the lower left is Hubble and here's what the Louvoir, uh, primary mirror would look, look at like. that. That's how many Hubbles will fit yes. into the prime, the object primary of Louvoir. Yeah, that's that's how many Hubbles fit in the you know the one Hubble primary fits into the into the hole in the back of the mirror where the instrument lights go. Can you pause it right there? Uh, oh, Carl, maybe go back. I want to see JWST. I, I presume that's JWST that just went away. Yeah, that's JWST there. For oh, sure. okay. Well, yeah, that's it's. So we're talking really. Yeah, there it is. So we're yeah. talking really. How, how? What's the size here? We're talking. So we're 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 currently developing two different versions for the study, um, and it has to do with the type of rockets that could potentially uh, bring it to to, to L two. One is a fifteen point one meter primary mirror, um, and a, one is a nine point two primary mirror. So you've got. Why do you have two to choose from? Uh, we have two to choose from because we don't necessarily know what the uh, what the heavy lift technology of the twenty thirties is going to be, and so the the we we scale things based off of how we think we can package the largest possible primary mirror within whatever launch fairing we have. Okay. Mm. Can okay. I just jump in as well? Um, yeah, go ahead. So, so I'm sorry, Deborah. Also, I think that we're, we're, as a community, we're doing our due diligence, right? We understand that these missions are incredibly expensive. Yeah. And so, uh, for example, two of the missions, Louvoir and HabX, really represent a continuum of telescopes, uh, with, with Habax being a smaller telescope and Louvoir being this giant, you know, 15, 20 meter telescope, uh, parked at L2. Um, and so what we want to explore are the cost and the science and the technology trade-offs, um, during the study that we're doing so that we give the American taxpayers the best, you know, the most science for their taxpayer bucks. Yeah. And that's, did, a, that's did, I you, did I hear you guys say, we're looking at, or you all are looking at missions for the 2030s now. Yep. That's a long time in the future. Why so far into the future? You guys are getting started now and you're looking ahead at maybe two decades of work? Where is it? What? Well, over the history of all of these large flagship type missions, it basically takes 20 or more years to go from pencil on paper ideas to, to actually putting, putting stuff up in space. I mean, JWST is a perfect example. You know, JWST got started quite a quite a while back, on the order of twenty years ago. You know, the the first real pieces of the idea for Hubble was was in nineteen sixty nine. So you know, these these things take many decades to put the largest, most complicated, and and uh, you know, most scientifically ambitious machines out there. It takes decades to right. to, to build it and test it. 
we we also uh, we also know that there will be some technology gaps. So we're trying to identify what those will be, uh, and then the community can focus on solving what are the best mirror coatings, what are the detectors that we'll use, what are the heavy launch vehicles. Um, so there are a lot of uh, new technologies, new engineering uh, inventions that will need to be made so that we can actually do this really compelling uh, and innovative science. Right. We've talked about this a little bit before with uh, with technology gaps. These are these things where when you're making your plan, you're not quite sure what's going to happen, what's going to be available yet. So you do your best to what? Just just use technological placeholders uh, for what might be event. Like I, I know with JWST, there were some things that needed to be invented uh, before it could go. And that was one of the things that put it a little bit behind schedule a couple of few years ago. Uh, is that what you would, how would you would characterize a technology gap? These things we don't know yet uh, that will yeah. exist, but we need them to do the science. Yeah, we've started with, and, and one of the hardest things I would say about our job, um, I didn't I know how John feels about this, but it's trying to imagine what are going to be the scientific compelling questions in the 2030s, right? That, that we, that we imagine that today in the 2017, you know, we'll want to do. Um, and so we, we're f starting with the science cases and developing those really grand visions. And then we're asking, what is the instrument? What are the instruments and the telescope that we're going to need? Uh, to be able to really definitively answer those questions. Uh, and so then once we have that, then that flows down to, okay, can we, could we do that today? Could we build it? Or if not, what are the missing pieces? Okay. And it's really, it's really important to, to, to extend on that to, to say that in most cases, we won't know what the, the science of the 2030s is. And so we have to, we have to design an observatory in the true sense of the word that's flexible enough to be able to do the science that we don't know it's going to happen. That's a good point. I often talk about technology, but we really don't even know what science we're going to want to do yet. Or, uh, so that's a good that's a good point. Deborah, but, I, but I know what I know what science Deborah is going to do with it. Well, I'm, why don't we? I was going to. I'm glad you did that. It's a good segue because Deborah has to go. So would you uh, soon? She has to leave our hangout early. So Deborah, can you give us some sense of what you're interested? The science that you'll be working on with Louvre. Sure, sure. Um, so I've been working on exoplanet detection for the last 20 years using a technique called the radial velocity technique. We look at the star and the star wobbles around a common center of mass by a planet that's that's tugging it. So what we really wanted to do now that we found many planets, we still want to find smaller Earth-like planets, but ultimately the grand goal is to figure out whether they're alive. And so that means taking an, an image of those little pale blue dots orbiting nearby stars and to get spectra of the atmospheres. So if you if, if we were looking back at the Earth, for example, and, and took a spectrum, you'd see the, the spectrum that's right here. Uh, shown right here is this green jagged line, which is intensity as a function of wavelength. So this bit of the spectrum spans from 0.4 microns to 2.4 microns. And you can see that there are some features that have been identified on this plot. Um, we could see uh, the uh, Rayleigh scattering in the bluer part of the spectrum. We could see a very sharp oxygen line um, here, which, which is really unique to our oxygen-rich atmosphere. There are big bands of water vapor. There's carbon dioxide. There's methane. There's ozone. So we can put together a, a, an understanding of the exoplanet atmosphere by looking at the spectrum, and we can get a hint of whether or not there's life there that's actually driving and modifying the climate in the way that life um, changes the atmosphere of our planet. Uh, so, so this. I'm is, sorry. I love that methane picture you've associated. Right, with. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yep. <laughs> have to have a little bit of humor. <laughs> and so this um, is. And, I'm, I'm, yeah. Please, please continue. I'm sorry. Oh, so if if we could pull up the other slide on the exoplanet uh, yields, yeah. So, so the question is, so to do this, why haven't we already done this? Why haven't we gone out and gotten pictures? Um, well, we have to null out the light from the host star, which is incredibly bright. Bring up and then expose down so we can see these very faint targets. And then we have to be able to integrate or collect light from those little faint targets for, in some cases, a uh, hundred hours. Um, so that we can get that spectrum that we just saw. 
And here's where actually size matters a lot. So our, we, we defined our science case. We want to find out if the planets are alive. And now we ask, what do we have to do to answer that question? Um, what is the smallest possible telescope that we could build that would, would be able to address this? And on the, you see two pictures. One on the left shows, um, these dotted rings, which are basically, um, annuli or distances from the sun going out from 10, 20, 30, and 40 parsecs from the sun. And the picture on the left shows the number of Earths that we could detect real true earth analogs uh, with some probability where green is, is a slam dunk. We've, we really detected it. We're sure of it. And red is we, we think we have something, but we're just not too sure. Um, and so with a smaller telescope, a sort of six meter class telescope, um, we, we collect the number of dots that we have on the left side of that figure. And by the time we go to a 15 meter telescope, we're detecting hundreds of exoplanets. Um, the point of Luar is not to just find a few cases and say, wow, that's interesting. Now let's build a bigger telescope so we can really figure out something about the statistics. We're really trying to do a survey right from the beginning. And that means that we have to detect hundreds of planets um, to be able to statistically make a statement about what fraction of them are alive. Okay, and why are they... Why, why are they with the outer with the outer ones in this diagram on the on the right why are they in red i, I missed that yeah both, both on the right and on the left you see some red dots yeah and as you get further away uh from the earth then the the objects are become fainter um and also the angular separation between the planet and the, and the star gets smaller which makes it more difficult to resolve or separate out the planet uh, and get a good result so you need the larger ap aperture to be able to separate those tiny you know, Earth Sun one AU sorts of distances. All right, it, I, I guess I, I just want to clear up that this isn't this has nothing to say about habitability, so much as whether you can see these as a function of how big your telescope these, is. These are these are all Earth uh, Earth twin candidates. So that so, so implied in that is habitable. Exactly. Oh, okay. Exactly. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So, then. Yes. They're 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 at a distance from their host stars. Um, where liquid water would pool on the surface, um, and you'd have very temperate, you know, sorts of climate. Okay. All right. Did you have Did you have more slides you wanted to show, or was that uh, was Was those the two? <laughs> those are Those are the. I think this is the big one. We We want to do other science with Louvois as well, and I'll let actually John speak to that. Okay. Go ahead, John. Well, I mean, one of one of the really nice things about the way we've designed Louvois is that. At the exact same time that we're spending 100 hours, say, looking at some of these very faint uh, exoplanets, um, we can use the collecting area to also be doing very, very deep fields. So if you think about the Hubble Deep Field, for example. I Hubble do all deep the time. Field, yeah, it went, <laughs> it went down to about a magnitude of about 30, right, roughly speaking, if we want to put numbers to it. Mm -hmm. um, fun fact, Louvoir will do that in one hour. So what it took Hubble to do its deep field Luvar will do in an hour. Yeah, I think it stared for 11 days uh, to get that image. So, yeah. And and um, so if you want to spend all the time that we would need to be getting that spectrum, um, at this, Luvar would be going down to something like 34th magnitude. And at that sort of depth, we would be talking about almost every every pixel in the image landing on, on a galaxy or, or you know, on a, on a very faint star in the halo of our galaxy or on any of these other things. And so... Our ability to to work in parallel is is a strength of the observatory, and um, we've designed the instruments to be able to to be able to do that. Um, I myself like to study the uh, what we call the circumgalactic medium. I think we have sort of a toy diagram of, of the circumgalactic medium here um, that just shows what uh, what the gas surrounding galaxies looks like. Um, and one of the things that we don't understand is how galaxies go from fo star forming things to sort of dead elliptical galaxies and and the answers probably lie in this in in this circumgalactic medium so galaxies themselves the stars only make up a, a small fraction of the, the gas and surrounding these things what louvoir would be able to do is uh to be able to take hundreds of little pencil beams through that circumgalactic medium and measure the properties of the gas in all the spaces around the galaxy and uh that way we would be able to characterize what gas is flowing in and forming stars what gas is being violently expelled after supernovas, and what gas is being recycled. 
Currently, we can only do that in, in, in computer simulations. And Lubar would, it, would, would, would allow that. I've never heard of a CGM. Circa, what is it again? Cir- Circumgalactic medium. So it's just basically the, the, the extended halos of gas surrounding galaxies. Yeah, you may want to take a look at the scale that is shown on this... Uh, yeah, I'm not uh, sure people can read that. Uh, maybe you could zoom it a bit for us, Carl. Yeah, sure. So very in, at the, very in at the center, that, that little sort of yellowish thing at the center close to the hand mark, that's the extent of the stars in a galaxy like the Milky Way. But the circumgalactic yeah. medium extends to many, many, many times uh, the, the, the volume around a, a star. So that point. little bit in the middle is the galaxy, and everything else is in the circle. This looks like a lot of material. It's... This, this is a lot of material, and that's been one of the exciting things that we've found with Hubble in recent years with the cost spectrograph, is how much material is locked up in that CGM. But we've only been able to do it with single pencil beam surveys through the CGM for any one galaxy. But there's a, another slide I hear that has, shows what you could be able to do with something like LUVAR with, um, uh, I think there's one with a green grid on it. What's nice about uh, LUVAR is that its instrument has what we call a multi-object spectrograph. So we'll be able to take not one, one tiny pencil beam, but hundreds in every exposure. And that's how we're going to be able to go through uh, the surrounding of these galaxies in multiple skewers and understand sort of the last 10 billion years of gas history for galaxies. What, are the, really little, what are the little squares here? The little squares are just sort of a visual representation of where you could get a spectrum. So traditional spectroscopy, you're only going to get one spectrum in one little spot on the sky. But with a multi-object spectrograph, you can get hundreds. And so, you know, when you're taking one exposure on the sky, you can now get 100 spectra. I think I've got one other thing that's a little bit better visualization of this. There's a galaxy that has a little box in front of it and some spectra. Um, not that one. There's not that one. Do, 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 do. I have so many. Sorry. <laughs> Keep going. There you go. Yep. So... This would be for a close-by galaxy, right? We've got a, a nice face-on spiral galaxy, but with something like Louvoir and the Lumos spectrograph on it, we can then tile it with this grid and get spectra of each one of those little star clusters. Wow. And, and along that line of sight, be able to figure out whether or not gas is flowing in or flowing out or what it's doing in the surroundings of those galaxies. That's, that's a game. That's an absolute game. Changer. That's that's some big data right there. Yeah. You're talking... <laughs> Yeah, I think, I me- and John, correct me if I'm wrong, my memory is that, and from, from many galaxies, including our own, the amount of mass in the in the gas, inflowing, outflowing gas, can equal or even exceed the mass of stars. That's absolutely right. And and we've, you know, we're, we're still trying to figure out what, what the the upper limits are on, on the amount of stuff that's locked up in the CGM. And it's really hard to do when you can only do it one sight line per galaxy, but when you can do hundreds per galaxy, you're not only going to get the total amount, but you're going to get where it's flowing in, where it's flowing out, which parts are enriched here, which parts are enriched there. So instead of, of trying to understand the statistics by looking at hundreds of thousands of galaxies, you can look at a thousand galaxies and hundreds of sight lines through them. Hang you on. can basically do 3D mapping of the gas and galaxies, which is something we can only do right now in, in computer simulations. And so it's it's really going to be a wonderful match to the computer simulations. All right, so I just want to emphasize something you I think I heard Harley say. Did you just say that the amount of gas, the outflows in the CGM, could exceed all of the stars in the galaxy? Yeah, so if you if you take, for example, oxygen, there's as much oxygen in the circumgalactic medium of our Milky Way galaxy as there is in the disk with the stars. Wow. So half the air, half the air you're breathing right now came from uh, outside the galaxy. In the but the de- it must be, uh, Carl, can you stop uh, sharing your screen for a sec for us? Um, so the, the density, it must be an issue of, of density though, right? I mean, it's got to oh, be yeah. a lot, lot smaller, right? I mean, there may be more no, of it, but the it's spread out over larger areas. Yeah, so go, go back. You know, I mean, if you think of that toy diagram we showed before, right? The, the area locked up in stars is very, very small. The volume locked up in stars there, but the volume of the CGM is very, very large. Okay. Well, we only have five. Ahead. I only have five minutes of time left for yeah. Deborah, and I want to make sure she gets. I want to get uh, her thoughts on some other things before she has to go. So, Deborah, is there anything else that you're working on with? I know you're looking at exoplanets and habitability, biosignature activity of these exoplanets. What uh, What are some of the other things that you're going? You've got going on. Um, that's beyond Louvoir, <laughs> beyond Louvoir. Well, or... I guess I meant as, as it, uh, you know, the project itself, I just want to make sure that you get to say everything that, you know, yep. that you're working yep. on before uh, you have to go. So it's a, a whole suite of instruments that are designed to detect and characterize planets. 
Um, and that's really the focus of, of, you know, my part of the team, uh, the Louvoir uh, Science Technology Development Team. Uh, exoplanets has become this giant booming industry. It really has. <laughs> um, and and uh, the discovery, the rate of discovery is just stunning. So uh, so it's enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very true. Very well, true. Let me, actually, let me ask Deborah before she, she goes, just to give the folks, our audience, um, uh, some uh, quantitative measure of how exciting this is, um, and I know I know Deborah that there is a lot of uncertainty in the following numbers, and you're one of the experts in the field. Is that what's the current estimate? I know the the uncertainty is huge. What's the current estimate of the fraction of stars in our own Milky Way, say, that have an Earth-like world, not an Earth, but a candidate Earth-like world? Yeah, the the numbers still vary wildly, and that's because um, the technique that I used, the Doppler technique, wasn't able to find those planets. Right? Um, we're building instruments now that we hope will do actually do that. Um, the Kepler mission uh, stopped just short of pushing out to habitable worlds, and so the statistics that we have are based on extrapolations. Right, which is always a sort of shaky place to be, but I think that the numbers are, you know, fairly between 10% and 50% of stars will have planets that are about the mass of the Earth at distances from their host star where they intercept the amount of energy that we intercept and probably have liquid water pooling on their surfaces. Yeah, I think that's one of the most um, um, absorbing, one of the most exciting statistics or discovery yeah. out of Kepler is. <laughs> And even if it's quote unquote only ten percent right. of the stars in the sky have candidate Earth like worlds. I mean, how exciting is that going out on a dark night to know that ten percent of the stars in the sky yeah. have plausibly would have an Earth like world in orbit around it. Especially since twenty five years ago, you know, astronomers were saying, Well, gee, maybe most stars don't have planets. Maybe the sun is really unusual. And so now we actually Actually, know that virtually all stars are born with planetary systems. Yep, some very interesting and bizarre planetary systems too. Right, <laughs> as we've learned. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, Deborah, I wanted to thank you so much for taking time yeah, out. I don't, thank you. and uh, it's right. been really. This has been really great. Uh, uh, that's Deborah, Doctor Deborah Fisher. She's a professor of astronomy at Yale University. She's also the community co-chair of Louvoir. Uh, when are we going to know something, Deborah? Before you go about Louvoir and whether or not it will be going. How, what's the timeline here? What's NASA? Uh, well, we we will not finish our report until 2019. This is not a quick uh, weekend exercise. And then the decadal survey in 2020. We'll review uh, and decide the priorities for astronomy for the next decade. Um, and, you know, so it's a process. Uh, and, and probably after 2020, we'll have some sense of where these studies rank. Right. And so this is, this is part of the timing of the decadal surveys, which happen, as the name suggests, every decade. Exactly. The next one's in 2020. You want to be in that uh, consideration. Yeah. And so to make that uh, possible, you need to be done by 2019. So Exactly. Okay. So we got a while then. Uh, we got a while. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, well, thank you, Deborah. Uh, to, uh, you can, you're welcome <laughs> to hang if you got to go or whatever. But I want to, I want to move um, to a couple of the I want to show first of all the animation that we looked at that um, that John brought. So uh, while Carl is queuing that up, uh, I have a question from uh, Kieran Kumar on Facebook, who is asking, uh, uh, "Where is this going to be? Where are you going to put it? Is it going to go to L two, L one, L ten? Yeah, the, the the current the current plan is L two. Okay." All right, so yeah, that's going to be it's going to be up there. JWST will either still be working or it won't. Uh, w first, I think, is all is, is W first going there, Harley? I think so. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, okay, so here is a uh, well, I, I won't narrate it. I'll let John do. Go ahead, John. Yeah. So one of the fun questions you can ask yourself is how do you put a fifteen meter telescope inside of an eight meter fairing and then unfold it? And so this is uh, a rendering of what the what the unfolding and, and, and deployment sequence would look like for something like Lubar. Um, that primary meter is, is 15 meters, and then we have to have a, a very large uh, star shade you know, to basically occult all the, the light from the sun. And then the uh, observatory itself sits on this gimbal so that you can aim it around like that. And the colored blocks in there represent the space taken up from the instruments. Now, like Hubble, Lubar is being designed from the ground up to be serviceable. We want to be able to, to have this be a telescope that can function for, you know, Hubble's been functioning for, for a quarter century. Louvoir should function for a half century or more. 
Um, we'd like to be able to have all the instruments be hot swappable in the same way that they are on Hubble um, and for, for everything to, uh, you know, to be serviceable so that this can truly be, be a, a telescope that, that uh, can be around for, for quite a while. Now, for everybody watching this, looks, look, this looks incredibly familiar uh, to us, although those wings, when it unfolds, there's two wings instead of one, I can JWSD. Yep. So this is the design, including, um, including sun shields, uh, yep. that are you don't know as we've talked about you don't know yet which rocket will be available to launch something like this uh, That's right. but it will be foldable almost certainly you can you can gather that much yeah more, there's right? there's no way we can we can fit a, an aperture of this size that without having it unfold um, so it's it's got it's got to deploy but the good news is is that and, and I wanted to, to bring this up for a variety of things when we were talking about technology is that we're going to now have a lot of heritage thanks to W First. We're going to know how to to deploy segmented mirrors in space thanks to W First. We're going to know how you mean to. JWST. Uh, I'm yeah. sorry, JWST. Sorry, um, JWST is going to tell us how to how to do how to do deployments like this. JWST is going to have these micro shutter arrays to be able to do multi object spectroscopy. So we're going to get some of the heritage from that. And JWST is going to tell us how to have big mirrors be be stable out. Um, Hubble has taught us how to how to service things in space and how to package instruments in a way to, to be serviceable. So there's a lot of heritage. Not we're not going from scratch with all of these things. Um, right. But, and I want to I want to get back to this idea of serviceability in just a minute. But I want to. So are, is it an oversimplification to say that uh, Louvoir is basically a wider wavelength, multi wavelength, and much larger version of JWST? Much of the equipment sounds like it's going to be more or less the same micro shutters, multi-object spectro spectrographs, uh, things like that. It's just bigger. Well, I mean, it's, so, so JWST of course is highly optimized for the infrared. infrared I know that. Yes. It's an infrared yeah. telescope and this and one, it's, however, it's kept cold. so, so I, I, I would, I would tend to say that this is a much larger version. It, it covers basically the same wavelength range that Hubble does now. So when you think about, you know, sort of the far ultraviolet to the, to the infrared, um, uh, range that Hubble has, this is basically the same wavelength range as Louvoir. But the instrument packages, depending on which wavelength you're looking at, are either going to be scaled up versions of things from JWST or the imaging camera, for example, for Louvoir called HDI, is going to be a very large scaled up version in many ways of the wide field camera three on Hubble now. So it, it will go, it'll have an ultraviolet visible channel and an infrared channel. Um, the big difference, of course, is scale, right? When you put something behind 15 meters, <laughs> The camera there is going to be a 2.5 gigapixel camera. HDI is going to be nice. Very nice. We have a rough estimate of its mass at about 1,200 kilograms. And, and so it's, it's going to be a big, heavy camera. Well, okay. That is, that's, really, that's really great. And I'm, uh, I want to go to the UV part for just a minute. Because yeah. as you mentioned, Hubble right now, and Carol has told us about this too, Carol Christian, on many Hangouts, uh, that if you want U ultraviolet data... There's only one game in town, and that has that's to be right. gotten in space. And right now, that's the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, right. Will there be anything between Hubble's eventual ending of the mission and Louvoir for the ultra uh, for the ultraviolet? Uh, well, there are. So the the answer is hopefully yes. Right now, there are uh, there are proposals out for uh, medium class and the Explorer class things like uh, mid X missions. Um, I know that there are a couple of ultraviolet. Uh, proposals that go in there. Um, there, NASA is looking into the possibility of doing probe class missions. So, uh, sort of in the scale in between something like a Kepler and something like a flagship would be a probe class mission. Um, and there are designs potentially there for UV things. But all of these things are are either proposals that are active now or things which are on paper. There, there, there are no commitments from NASA uh, right now to do an ultraviolet observatory. There is a uh, um, there are some smaller missions that will have UV capability in the, in the immediate time frame, but in terms of in terms of really doing UV well, that's something that the community has to has to embrace through the proposal process and through the decadal process. Okay. All right. Let me get a couple comments here. Adam Synergy is commenting: L two is the place to hang out. That's true. It's becoming like the West Palm Beach of uh, space, yeah. isn't it? It's going to be really expensive to get some uh, some real estate out there, but. Yeah. Um, but Galaxia, then she goes, I agree, Tony should move to L2. Well, it's funny you should mention that, Galaxia. I've already got my space station on the works, and it's also in the next decadal survey. No, but they don't know about it yet. But by 2019, I'll submit it, and I'm going to blow them all away. My little, my little 
habitat is going to go oh, to L2, to L2 and L2. that's right. And I'm going to be living out there doing my hangouts at L2. Yeah. And uh, so, yes, I've, I've already got plans for that. Um, so serviceable. Really? Really, John? How really? are you wishful thinking here or are we going to buy? Are you just thinking, wow, this is 2030. Uh, this is Mars time frame. We're going to be on Mars by then. Uh, sure. No, I mean, why not? We're going to have heavy lift. Ro- is it going to are you, are you designing it for robotic servicing or people servicing or both? Um, well, I mean, I think, you know, first I should step back and say that it's, it's actually written into law now that future missions of this scale have to be serviceable. That does not guarantee that they're going to be that they are going to be serviced. <laughs> they're going to have access to serviceability. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, but but if I if I look at JWS if I look at JWST for example, the way that the instruments are packaged inside the optical assembly for JWST makes it very difficult to actually pull the instruments out and swap them in the way that we do with Hubble now. Um, the way we're designing Louvoir, on the other hand, like in that animation, is you know much in the same way that you could pull wide field camera three out of out of Hubble and replace it if you wanted to. We would want to be able to do that with most, if not all of the instruments. Now your question, should that be robots or should that be astronauts? Um, I think ideally that you want to be able to design it so that so that both could do it. Um, and you know, getting to L2 and actually servicing out there at L2 is probably going to be the foray of, of, of robots initially. But I can guarantee you there are people in the astronaut corps that would love to fly out to L2 and, and do something like that. Okay. I think it's 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 much more important to just to, to to from the ground up design the observatory to be able to take instruments in and out and and swap as much as you can if you need to. Okay. Uh, all right, Larry. Larry, it's iced tea. Iced tea. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. There was a, okay. Sean, you say Sean Sullivan has to go, but I was hoping he had a, he had asked a question way up here. Do you happen to see where it is by any chance, uh, Carl? I'm trying to. Sean had a good question at the beginning. I'm yeah, or Sean, I've got it right. I've got it right here. Oh, uh, could you Sean ask Sullivan, him, yes, thank you. Sean Sullivan, off, off, often does one project like this get started and then new technology or perhaps better methods come along midstream and given the time it takes to formulate and launch, you know, so what are you doing? I think essentially is what he asking to adapt to new technology, maybe new thought process that are, coming into the scientific zeitgeist, like exoplanets exploded in the last 10 years. So how are you designing the program to take advantage of adaptability? Well, so there's, 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 I think that's a good question. That's a really good question. I have, I have sort of two ish answers to that. The first I I, I mentioned somewhat before, which is to really build from the ground up uh, to be uh, more of a Swiss army knife, true observatory class mission. If you design the, instruments to do a specific thing in a very specific way, um, then you might run afoul of changes in technology or changes in science priorities. But having a workhorse imaging camera on the observatory, everybody's going to want to be able to take images you know, from here until the end of astronomy. So we know we're going to want an imaging camera. We're going to know we want spectroscopy. Um, so in the same way that Hubble has very general purpose um, instruments in it, we want to do that with Louvoir as well. But in terms of changing technology, say detector technology or uh, mirror technology or things like that, I mean, that's an active part of the development of this thing. When we're, when we're looking at that's why they call it a science and technology definition team. We, we are actively looking at what we think detectors could be in 10 years. What's their sensitivities then? But we don't want to, to, to do everything completely pie in the sky and, and, put all of our hopes on technologies that may or may not exist. There has to be a, a good path forward in terms of realizing some of the key technologies for the observatory. You know what I'm interested in, John, and I wish I had asked, remembered to ask this when Deborah was here to get her thoughts, but when you start a collaboration like this, or when you, you right now you guys are proposing to be in, for a, uh, to be considered in the 20, uh, 20 decadal survey, how do groups like this get started? I, does NASA say, we're doing another decadal survey. If you want to be in it, you better get your stuff together and get going now. And then how do groups like yours come together uh, to... Well, there was... So in the in the case of the STDTs... Um, uh, a couple What's of that? Years ago, that? That sounds really, really dirty. Technology. 
Yeah, that's case, TDTs. That's the, that sounds... So the, there are those four teams, the four STDTs. In the case of those, um, a couple of years ago at the at the American Astronomical Society meeting, Paul Hertz, uh, who's who's the, the head person uh, at, at, for astrophysics at, at NASA, that's NASA, right. NASA. Uh, put put out the call for, for, for membership, for people to apply for membership in the STDTs. And so many hundreds of folks put in, you know, a CV and a reason why they want to be part of the team. And then um, a group of people down selected that to the teams, and then we were asked to formally asked to join the teams. So you have so to this, be in an SDT. I have to say this right, so it doesn't sound like SDD. Um, it, 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 you need to be in one of these in that team to be a part of anything that goes into the Cato survey. No, no, no. So a, a very big part of Louvoir and any of the other missions is we will. You know, we're we're defining the you know the things specific to the instruments and many of the science cases. But we, a, a critical piece of this is going back out to the community and making sure that we haven't missed stuff. So at various stages, we are going to be bringing, you know, what we think the instruments can do out to the community and ask people what kind of science they could do with that. Because it's a guarantee that 24 people on the SDDT can't think of everything. Right. So, you know, we, we have built exposure time calculators that the community can use to, to, to try to figure out their science thing. But this will not be successful. None of these will be successful without strong community engagement because it's you know as deborah said before it's it's a very large investment in in in, in uh tax dollars for the for for the public and so we want to make sure that every aspect of the astronomical community can provide input on, on how to how to build these these great observatories okay cool. now i should note that the um the the, the teams and this is true of, of louvoir but the other three teams as well from whom we'll be hearing in the in the coming months have been very um, open, very collegial uh, at the um, variety of astronomy conferences and so on that have have gone on for some years now. They're starting to build up a real a real history here. So there is exactly as John said, there are opportunities for uh, professionals to come in and say, "Hey, wait a minute, here's another idea. What do you all think of this?" So it's been a been a pretty it's been a very open and collegial. This. Also, just from history, the National Academies, and John, you may know the number. I, I don't know if the 2020 is going to be the eighth or the ninth decadal survey, but some number like that. 90 like years. That. Wow, that's pretty cool. Well, the first, uh, we, we can talk about the history of it sometime. The, the very first one was in 1960, although there was probably one in 1950 as well. In any case, um, they will also ask for not only the white papers and studies and so on from these four but they will also open up the process and say, if somebody has got some idea that we did not think of a concept or a science goal that we did not think of, um, here's your opportunity to, to present it. By the way, just a little side historical note is that the precursor, the, uh, the um, precursor to what is now JWST came in from outside the process um, in the, in the 1990s. Um, was that the next generation uh, space telescope? Was that what it was called? Then? Telescope. It was proposed by a group of uh, by a large group of outsiders stepped mm, in. I remember that. Made, yep. Yeah. So, it's, so John makes a very good, very good point. Okay. Well, I'm looking. So, Facebook. Uh, Andrew Planet is putting some really good links in the comments to read more about Louvoir. So, I would have. Uh, there's one. There's the uh, uh, Goddard, uh, the Goddard uh, NASA.gov. Um, a web page on, on Louvoir, so you can learn more about this mission there. Um, Thank you. All four of those missions um, have very approachable websites. Right. So could, we're we're going to be updating our website in the very new fu near future with even more stuff in it as well. That's so. great. Okay. And uh, Kieran Kumar is asking a question that's close to my heart because I worked in data management for most of my software career, and I'm I want to know the answer to this too. So how much data? Uh, will this survey generate, or how much? It's not. It's not a survey, is it? It's a telescope that you'll be pointing and shooting uh, at yeah. things. And uh, how, how many? How much data? You said this was like a how many gigapixel camera? Well, yeah. So, so one of the instruments, the high definition imager, would have uh, on, on the order of two and some change gigapixels. <laughs> that's, that's just obscene. <laughs> And that that would be that would be the highest throughput in just in terms of an, an, an individual image or an individual piece of data having the, the largest footprint data wise. Um, but I don't you know, I mean, I, I we don't anticipate that data throughput um, is going to be the is going to be the bottleneck. On, on you won't be uh, I.O. limited then, I guess. huh? Well, 
it, it, you know, it's it, it'll it'll it, it's quite a it's quite a, a, a pipe back, but ideally it, we're not going to be I/O. Okay. All right. Well, and then you've also got a hundred multi spectra coming in at once. Uh, these will be presumably not tiny amounts of data either. But uh, anyway, no, it's, it, it will generate quite a lot of data. But again, you know, we're, we're going to have heritage. W first has a lot of CCDs on it. Yeah. And that's going to be a lot of high throughput. Yeah. Got and it sounds like that you're really relying on this experience that you're going, we're going to gain, uh, from deploying JWST, from using JWST at the ELP 2 point. It won't be serviceable, but it'll be out there. Uh, and then when the following up with W first and its capabilities as well with this large camera, wide field of view, what is the field of view going to be? for Louvoir. Is um, it a wide field instrument? Narrow? No, no. So W first is basically going to be the wide field game. Um, the field of view of, of Louvoir will be roughly the same as it would be for something like Hubble. So when you, when you think about the size of the Hubble deep field, that's about three by three arc minutes on the sky. And an individual image in HDI would be, would be similar. But, and this is, uh, I, we can have Carl bring this up just to give an illustrative example of, of the things you could do. Um, there is, there is, Carl, there's an image that one looks like it's got a little bullseye diagram in it. Um, so let's see. Yeah, nope. there. So on the right-hand side is an image of stars, not in our galaxy, but in Andromeda. And this was done with Hubble, um, with one of the largest images tiled together that Hubble ever that did. That was the FAT survey, that. wasn't it? That's the FAT survey yeah. by Julianne Dalcanton. So you can see individual stars in Andromeda. This 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 tears me up every time I see it. Because it's just <laughs> I know it's amazing. <laughs> but here's here's the thing. You know, by doing that, we can understand the history of stars in Andromeda and how they form. On the left shows you where in our nearby universe you could take that exact same kind of image, but with something like Louvre. So hang on, hang on. So all the stars in all the galaxies in that square on the left, you can resolve. Yes, so if you take the 15.1 meter Louvoir, you would be able to take images like the one on the right all the way out to the Coma Sculptor Cloud. Nice. And this is actually really important, not just to say, wow, that's a lot of stars, but <laughs> notice how we don't actually hit any elliptical galaxies, even with JWST. And those are fundamentally different galaxies than spiral galaxies, like, like Andromeda or our own. So to be able to understand star formation in very different types of galaxies at this kind of spatial resolution, you need you're going to need a bigger boat, right? You're going to need you're going to need something. <laughs> um, and so by going out to 15.1, you can take images like this really everywhere out in, in the local neighborhood, and that's going to be utterly transformative. It's really going to change how we understand the, the life cycle of stars and how they move around in their host galaxies and how they influence each other, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, so yeah, there's a big discussion going on in the chat about L2. A lot of people interested in L2. The, and Bill Druin is commenting the Lagrange points are stable third body solutions for any two massive bodies in orbit, so long as the third body is negligible in proportion to the other two. Uh, that's a real fancy way of saying that they are just stable areas uh, in orbit around the sun. Um, no. Well, not, not not really semi-stable. Semi. -stable. semi yeah, exactly. He probably he probably very definitely knows what he what he's talking about. Yeah, that, but yeah you, definitely. Uh, can you uh, stop sharing your screen for a second, there, Carl? I need to get everybody back on the. There we go. Let me get everybody back up here again. There we go. Okay. So, um, all right. Well, uh, I want to know how this telescope is going to be operated. Now we look at we use Hubble. There's a time mm -hmm. allocation committee. You have to say why you want to use it and make mm -hmm. a good science case for it. And every year they get together. They call them cycles. And they say, mm -hmm. yes, we're going to select the following people because your science is good enough to be Hubble. And they give it to you in units of orbits. You have yeah. 10 orbits or 50 orbits or whatever it is you ask for. My uh, Two questions. How will Louvoir be used? Will it be similar like that? And what is the unit of allocation that will that people will be given time on is it hours is it if it's orbits then that's going to be weird because it's around the sun i imagine but um well i think the answer to your first question is the much more important one is whether or not this is going to be a guest of i know i'm just nosy about the other part yeah. um and and the good news is that yes our 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 intent is is to have this be very much in the spirit of hubble's guest observer program and that the the vast majority of the time uh would be would be driven by it, People proposing, going through attack, like you said, and getting 
getting their time on it. I suspect since you're out in L2 that we would just put units of, of, of seconds or hours in terms of the quanta. I don't know exactly what the quanta would be. Um, we could call them, you know, quanta of podcasts or something like that. <laughs> quanta um, of podcasts. <laughs> but uh, I think much more important than that is the first. I know. I just, I like, I love the little details like that. Cause yeah, I well, like, I like to, with, with Hubble, you get an orbit, um, you know, and I think with JWS. Part, I mean, part of the reason why it's going to take us till 2019 to, 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 to finish this work is to actually think about the little details like that. Right. Because how, how, how you would schedule an observatory of this size, because to get it to move around on the sky and then settle down to, to be optically stable, to do what it needs to do, and then to move around again, you know, how you schedule that is very fundamentally different than how you schedule a telescope in low Earth orbit. That's right. That's right. And so we, we have to think very carefully about some of those particulars. And now that we have one end-to-end -end architecture basically in mind with the, you know, we've gone through the design process of the first of the two versions of Louvoir that we're developing, we can start to, to look into those those questions because the details matter. Yes, it does. So Chris Marshall is commenting, sweet, do you have room for guests on your L2 space station, Tony? No, not yet, because you have to apply for the, my SDDT. If once you've done that, <laughs> I'm a, once you're a member of my SDDT, then uh, we will uh, we'll discuss whether or not you can be in it. What's the, what's the membership charge? <laughs> Go to my web page, my web page, deepstarview.space slash HDTT. <laughs> hey, uh, I have a couple questions from Facebook from uh, Kyron Kumar. Um, I think we might have covered this at one point or another, but uh, one question is, how do we tell the difference between uh, uh, solid silicon planets and gaseous planets? And another question is, um, are there any plans to study our galactic center with this. And just real quick, one of the things we've been talking about programmatically with uh, this type of telescope and the decadal surveys and things like that, that I think is always interesting when interacting with the general public is they like to ask, well, how big is the investment? And it's very clear, like you said, as a per unit cost, a big investment, and it's also a big investment in the uh, astronomy community because so much science is done by so many people. But for the average citizen, if we go off of JWST, it's like a night out to Alamo draft house for two at once a year. Okay. So, okay. There's a lot of questions in there, Carl. So let's go back. Yeah. So yeah. Let's, sorry. Let's go back to, um, uh, uh so going back to the planets question. Yeah, yeah. The planets, the difference between, uh, how do we tell the difference between silicon based planets and gaseous okay. planets? Yeah. Let's do it's, that one. It's all in the spectra. It's all in the spectra. So when the light from the, the host star either transmits through the atmosphere of the planet or bounces off of it, um, and, and then we take the spectrum of, of that, or, or even just in sometimes in images, the differences in colors can give you hints to that. But it's really, if you can get a spectrum of that planet, you can tell very definitively the difference between those two cases. And more importantly, for planets with atmospheres, if you get a, a spectrum of uh, enough resolution covering enough wavelength, like Deborah mentioned, you can discern different types of atmospheres. The atmosphere of Venus looks fundamentally different than the atmosphere of Earth. And the atmosphere of Earth, as it was billions of years ago, is fundamentally different than it is now, right? The ozone and, 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 and oxygen features simply weren't there in, in the very early Earth. So we'll be able to discriminate between those uh, with, with something like Louvoir. And like Deborah said, you want to be able to do tens, if not hundreds of planets to get the true sense of, of, of diversity, you know, exoplanet diversity out there at, at a level of detail where you can definitely tell the differences between them in their atmosphere. Uh, one fun, f very fun thing to think about is that when you get images of these planets, if you continue to watch the images and you can get the images fast enough, you'll be able to see small changes in the amount of light coming from them. We call that albedo, um, the amount of reflected light off of there. If you see albedo changes, you can infer the presence of continents or, or water or uh, ice flows and whatnot on the surface of the, of the planet. And so it would be very fun to watch, even though it, you may only have a single pixel your image, you can watch how the light from that thing changes and infer whether or not it's got continents on it, which is kind of fun. Great. Well, what about the uh, question about looking at the center of our galaxy? Is that... Uh... Yeah. Yes, this, Louvoir would be fantastic for that because it has such fine scale resolution. Currently, from the ground, we use adaptive optics and, and take wonderful uh, images of the center of the galaxy in the infrared, and we can actually see the planet, the, sorry, the stars orbiting around the, the, the central black hole. With something like Louvoir, we would have a much smaller spatial scale um, and, and in visible light instead of in the infrared. 
because a lot of that work um, will be in partnership with telescopes on the ground, right? The 30 and 40 meter telescopes on the ground with adaptive optics are going to do wonderful things in the, in the infrared and in the near infrared, but Louvoir will be able to do the visible and the ultraviolet piece of that. Okay. And do you have any comments on, do you guys have any idea how much this is going to cost? Uh, no, because I mean, that's one of the things, part of this study is to identify the, the technolo- technology needs and the science needs from this. And then, and then as part of that, we actually do a costing exercise. That has not been done yet because we still need to get, know which instruments we were uh, going through the design lab, you know, the size and this, that, and the other thing, the technology estimates. And then that will get costed out and, and you know, estimated. Okay. Um, but right now, it's it, we, we just do not have a, a, an estimate for the cost. Okay. Well, um, Harley, can I get your comments on that? You've, you've been around a while. You know how NASA works. When in the process do people start worrying about how much things cost, generally? Oh, well, I, our colleagues are worrying, um, to the degree you can at this early stage, worrying about the cost right now. Right. In this particular yeah. instrument or, or right. mission. But I guess as missions go, when is it like halfway through the planning? Is it after it's been approved? Is there, you know, is there a time when people say, well, give me a budget? Right. It, it's some years in the future. Okay. And there is a stage, so-called phase A, in which sufficient design work is done on the instruments, on the optical system, operations, and so on. You can say, okay, we now know enough to do the costing. So, I would guess optimistically um, it's a decade in the future before that will be really um, substantively known. Yeah, Kim, Kieran Kumar is commenting, wow, individual stars in the Andromeda galaxy. That's right. You need to check out the FAT. Is it the survey? FAT survey, John? Is it's, Panchromatic, what? Pan? Panchromatic Hubble Archive. Uh, uh, sorry, Panchromatic Hubble Andromeda Treasury. Not the best acronym, but yes, P-H-A-T. I think it's an awesome acronym. <laughs> Well, I always have a hard time remembering what it means, but uh, yes, and it is, and they, they, it also, there's also some, if you go and look that up, you'll see images of just how many Hubble exposures it took to piece that together. And they did the part of the galaxy that they did because they they figured, well, we have, you know, that's a lot of Hubble time. So they, they did, they, they tried to maximize where they looked in the galaxy and then kind of figured, well, it's symmetrical. So a lot of Andromeda galaxy might be the same if you flip it, probably I mean, to, to first order. And so they didn't waste a lot of time doing the entire galaxy. But, yeah, it's an impressive survey. It really, really is. Um, okay, well, let me see. Is there any other comments and questions there, Carl, for us? Uh, not that I have seen. Uh, we, we got to uh, the ones on Facebook that I was looking at that I thought were pretty interesting about the planets, and particularly the interior of the galaxy, because, you know, Sagittarius A is awesome. But, yeah, that, that's about it. I'm trying to look up the percentage of... NASA budget that the JWST is, I think off the top of my head, it's about like 10%, but I don't want to be quoted on that. Like, I, it's like, know, I mean, for example, uh, on in the most recent budget request, it's on the order of $550 million, uh, sorry, $550 million for that. Okay. Year. So, you know, a NASA's budget is order of magnitude $20 billion. Right. Yeah. So it's... Yeah. Okay, before we leave, we're almost out of time. I want to get Chris Marshall's question in because it's a good one, and it's related to serviceability. Uh, he's asking, have you thought about having the ability to expand the size of the primary mirror by sending additional segments once the telescope is in orbit? That's a great question. Now, that is a fantastic question, and the answer is yes. There have been, In fact, there's a couple of designs that say along the lines of if it's if it's prohibitively expensive now, you build the infrastructure where you build the first set of rings and then fly out the, the, the next set of rings. There, there are design architectures for that that we've looked at. Um, there are design architectures that you can look at and try to sort of clamp ring on, on, onto it. So the answer is yes, we've, we've, we've looked into that. Um, it's, you know, it's one of those things where at some point you have to freeze a design concept and run that <laughs> and, and, and just say, this is, this is what we're, we're exploring right now to, to really identify the, the key science drivers and then how we map that onto the technological and instrument needs and things like that. Um, but it's, it's a great question and it is something that a lot of people have thought about. Yeah, it's something that you have to design for in advance. Well in advance. Yeah, you can't say, oh, hey, now that it's built and launched, let's add some more mirrors. 
you have to design it in advance. But John's exactly right. There are a number of very clever folks. Right? right. Yes, that's really great. Okay, well, I want to thank everybody. We are out of time. Uh, I want to thank my guest, Dr. John O'Meara. He's a professor of physics at St. Michael's College. He's also the, uh, the, the group lead for the Cosmic Origin Service Sci- Science Working Group for the Louvoir Mission. Uh, and joining us earlier, but she had to leave, was Dr. Deborah Fisher. She's a professor of astronomy at Yale University and uh, also the community co-chair of Louvoir. So this is a mission we need to keep our eyes on around 2019. I'm sure things are going to be getting very tense and exciting in the within the Louvoir team. So I hope you guys might consider coming back and giving us an update. I would absolutely love to. Thanks for the, giving us the opportunity to talk today. And if people want to ask me questions on Twitter, my handle is at Astronomera. Thank so. you. I'm glad I, I was neglect. I was, I'm, I've been remiss in doing that. Okay, folks. Yeah. Well, that is it. Uh, Carl, did you want to say something? Oh, I was just going to say, if you are using the hashtag, uh, uh, Astron- uh, Astro Coffee, you'll find his uh, Twitter handle because I've been quoting some of the stuff that you've been saying. So Yes, very good. Okay. Another easy way of finding it. Thank you, Carl. Okay, next week we are going to be talking. We'll have Astro Coffee hang out with Dr. Carol Christian and myself. We will be talking about Mercury and the atmosphere or the measurements of its atmosphere uh, a recent paper has come out that is the, the, where people have been looking at uh, the various characteristics of mercury so we hope you'll join us next week um, as far as and then following that we'll have our footsteps to mars hangout which harley is working on right now and we will announce that as soon as possible if you want to learn more about what hangouts are coming up please go to deepastronomy.space slash hangouts i've got a calendar there and i fill it in as soon as we fleshed out who's going to be there what the topic will be uh but every thursday we will be doing something so uh you can count on it now if you would if you would like to continue the conversation i'm heading over to twitch right now uh and i will be there in about five minutes if you guys want to do a little q a i'll be happy to, to talk with you about that stuff and um in, any of you guys if you still have time are welcome to stay but i understand if you've got to go and um i'll be over there in about five minutes folks thank you all so much for watching and as always keep looking up oh, <laughs> that's a rubber ducky <laughs> and happy apollo 11 anniversary everybody yeah, happy happy apollo- day. Yes. <laughs>